Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert. The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. But I call it leader first approach. That mm-hmm. that if you're the if you're the head of a of a unit of whatever size that wants to change, you're the first problem to solve. You're the first mind to expand because you you have the constraint. Right. So it's, mm-hmm. it's always going to be bottlenecked by you. You've got to raise yourself in order to raise your organization around you. Who is, but we already done that uh, in the other podcast. Those so. People may not have listened to that one. <laughs> so let's do it. Uh, who is uh, Michael K. Spade? <laughs> Junior, actually. Um, Junior. Uh, <clears throat> Well, I, I, um, I've been in the Agile space for uh, uh, 21 years. The year the manifesto got signed is when I started, um, unrelated. But, and uh, because, because I had training in psychotherapy, um, in change management and organization development, OD, um, in c- culture and leadership, uh, and later in integral and um, uh, professional coaching, I brought all that stuff into the coaching world as much as I could. I mean, that, that's been a focus of what I've done is, is systematically bringing in stuff about culture, about change, about uh, how organizations develop, about how leaders grow, um, all things outside of the, the scope of Agile as a methodology, totally, but, but highly needed, right? Because it's not just about practices, it's about the environment that it's practiced in. Um, so that's what I've done at Agile Coaching Institute, at Transformation, at um, uh, at the Collective Edge, my current company. Yeah. What was your journey into this space? Uh, well, so so like especially specifically Integral and Ken, um, I actually um, tagged along with uh, a psychologist friend of mine back in. Mm, probably the mid eighties uh, to Ken Wilber's birthday party at his house. And I mean, we, we, neither one of us knew him, uh-huh. um, but, um, and uh, you know, th- this was a long, long time ago. And uh, th- that was my first, you know, inter- I, I, had, I had heard of him um, cause uh, I was in a, a contemplative psychotherapy uh, master's program mm-hmm. and he was, he was in Boulder, you know, I, I grew up in Boulder and, and he used to live in Boulder. He lives in Denver now. But, uh, and um, we, so, and, and the main impression that I had from him in that was his massive collection of books. He had the uh, coolest damn collection of books I've ever seen, I think. I mean, and, you know, and, what and did I it didn't look like, I mean, like, yeah. it, was, it was just, you know, like, excuse me, bookcases full uh-huh. of books. A little library. <laughs> yes, like a, like a library, like, like something you see in a in a uh, in a movie or something. You know, I was going to say like natural. a James Bond movie or something like that. <laughs> <one of those laughs> <things>. <laughs> I don't know about James Bond, but that's interesting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so anyway, so so but in, and then I didn't I, I I didn't read his you know so, uh, at least one uh, colleague of mine in this master's program was you know reading his stuff like up from Eden mm-hmm. back then. Um, and I, I just wasn't interested. I was aware of it, but I wasn't interested at the time. And I think it took me, I don't remember exactly when it was when I started reading some of it. Well, I, I bought Sex, Ecology, and Spirituality um, in, I think, when it came out in 96. So I was, I was aware of something then, but I wasn't really paying attention to it. And then um, uh, there, there must have been something in the early 2000s. And I, I'm pretty sure I went to the Integral Spiritual Conference in 2007. Mm-hmm. and and met him and you know uh you know in a in a pretty small conference maybe 100 150 people um and uh you know got met a lot of the players in that world and then mm-hmm. subsequently went to a number of uh conferences they have, they had some really good um uh you know deep conferences mm-hmm. <laughs> and started <clears throat> I I'd have sort of dabbled with it, I guess I would say, before about 2013, uh, 
and <clears throat> and in in to, uh, so I and I, I wrote a book I wrote the book proposal for 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 what was this book. Um, it was called Coaching the Agile Enterprise at the time, and um, it uh, and somebody in the you know it, it was in Mike uh, uh, Cohn's uh, uh, book group, book, and yeah. so all, all the all the authors in the book group get to look at people's proposals to see whether they're okay with them being in or what suggestions they have, you know, because you're trying to you're applying to be in that series as well as having mm-hmm. the a Pearson publisher book, <laughs> and. Um, Somebody, I think it was Kenny Rubin, said something like, you know, you need an organizing principle for this book, you know, similar to what Mike Cohn did in uh, Succeeding with Agile, I think, which is quite a ways back. But, um, uh, and, you know, I remember sort of being annoyed with it at first, like, what do we, um, you know, in my, in my protective yeah. style. Um, it, but uh, it, it, it stuck in my craw, so to speak. And it was a great, it was a great suggestion. Thank you, Kenny. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I've ever told you that. Uh, yeah. and, 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 it, and then it would hit me like a ton of bricks. Ah, integral, of course, that's the, you know, because before, before I didn't, I didn't write the original proposal for the book with integral in it. Yeah. And then it was like, it, it was like so obvious in hindsight, like, the fuck, of course I got to, you know, do it about. <laughs> well, it, that's the a, only way to integral. look at it. Like if you want yeah, to coach the enterprise, right. uh, that's the only kind of framework to put it under, right? Yeah. yeah. It's the only thing that doesn't, um, that really doesn't distort what's going on. It, it has a place mm-hmm. for everything. I mean, that, the, the integral framework is about having a place for every perspective. It's not about mm-hmm. voting this one's better than that one or this one's the right one because integralists don't believe that. Yeah. <laughs> um, they believe that all perspectives are true. True. But part yeah. Of it. Yeah. And so, so the integral framework in general, integral theory, <clears throat> uh, aqual model gives you a place to put everything and so it became so obvious that <clears throat> you know to and and you know i shaped it into this is before i had a co-author i shaped it into you know like the i uh quadrant uh in, in integral you know i called specifically first leadership and engagement and then later mm-hmm. uh leadership and mindset <clears throat> to focus you know, it, that was consistent with the I quadrant, but it's not the full scope of the I quadrant. You could have all kinds mm-hmm. of things there, exactly. but they're not, they're not relevant to doing organizational change work, particularly. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, and, and then, mm, that, I don't know, that, that line kind of, uh, in terms of like my, my uh, relation to Ken, uh, uh-huh. culminated for me in, you know, Michelle and I did a <clears throat> interview with him uh, in about, uh, july 2019 or something as we were sort of trying to finish up uh the well we we finished it six months later the first draft and it was it was a really ken was so generous with his time and um uh you know he loves to talk about this stuff he he, you know uh it it was really sweet and and, you know then he wrote that praise piece which i was like you know because he has such a busy schedule and so many well that's yeah i was surprised like to see uh that you you got him (laughs) what about like leadership circle how did you uh because leadership circle is based on uh uh, not necessarily the uh, uh integral but uh more of uh Kind of cognitive development uh, and uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, work from you know Cradle Graves and and Spiral mm-hmm. Dynamics and all of that. Um, so how did how did you get introduced uh, to the uh, you know to Bob Anderson and Leadership Circle stuff? Uh, well, um, I'm not. It, it was it was almost certainly in 2012 um, because that's when I took my certification for the Leadership yeah. Circle. And, and I probably, I, you know, I, I remember hearing about it from people. I, I did ORSC, um, uh, Organization Relationship Systems Coaching. I did my certification back in like 2009 and yeah. um, to, 2010. And um, people in the ORSC community talked about the leadership circle as a really beautiful uh, uh, leadership 360 and, you know, like superlatively, I mean, you know, that, that is mm-hmm. best from, from wh- whoever I was, it, it, m- multiple people said that. And, and that was like, you know, it's one of those things where you're starting to, you know, I'm, I wasn't interested in it or whatever, yeah. but it was starting to come into my awareness. And like, I was, oh, that's, you know, I'm not, I'm not yeah. interested in that, but, but, <laughs> you know, I, but I do notice that it keeps showing up. 
And then it, it might have been Pete Barron's that uh, meant, I, yeah. I don't know. I, yeah. Somebody, I think, triggered um, the the uh, thought to to investigate it more fully. And um, I didn't have Bob in my certification, though. I think he was uh, in the uh, I think he was in the same hotel or something, teaching something yeah. else. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he was. Um, I didn't meet him for another few years, but um, uh, you know, and w so just on the level of uh, investigating. You know, it, it was just clearly it's such a beautiful design. It's so it's so it integrates the whole field of leadership. I mean, it really does. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, that's what he says he did. And that's what he did. You know, mm -hmm. the universal model of leadership is, you know, synthesizes, you know, most of the great leadership thinking and research. <clears throat> and, um, <clears throat> you know, and, and getting to know him, you know, more at, at like the, uh, the uh, they have a leadership summit. Uh, either annually or every other year yeah. and um, got him to spend more time with him. He's just a beautiful uh, man. Um, mm -hmm. He, 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 uh, he's like a programmer that, you know, some programmers go home from a, a day's work coding and they, to, work, <laughs> to relax, they write more yeah. code <laughs> in their own projects. Right. Yeah. So he, he, he wouldn't do that, but he would go home and, you know, play with spreadsheets because that yeah. was his joy. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm like, dude, that is so not me. But well, it's interesting, especially when it comes to human behavior. And when you look, start looking at this stuff, it's very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So it must mm -hmm. have been then in 2015 when Lalu came with reinventing organizations, um, and uh, you referenced Lalu in uh, in your book. How, what what type of uh, reaction did you have to that? Because when I read it, it, that was like a trigger point for me, one of the like mm -hmm. aha moments or realizations, mm -hmm. like it resonated so well with me. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember talking to Michael De La Maza. I don't know if you if you know Michael De La Maza. Sure, uh, sure. He's like, why are you so crazy? You know how Michael is? Like, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> he was curious why I was so crazy about the book. And it really had a profound uh, 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 impact uh, on how I see things. How did it impact you? Well, I already knew all the spiral dynamics literature before he came out with his book. So I knew what it was based on. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I had been reading um, uh, The Never Ending Quest, Claire Graves' book that was published posthumously <clears throat> um, and is really hard to get right now. It's out of print. And, um, uh, and, and so I was, I was enamored with, you know, Graves' research, especially. Yeah. Um, but uh, what, I, what I really loved about what Lalu had done was to focus it specifically on organizations. I mean, you know, Spiral Dynamics is written for, you know, the research was done on individual people, not on societies or anything like that. Uh... Don Beck and Chris Cowan expanded it into, um, you know, more social kind of situations and, you know, culture and the history of people and whatever. But um, uh, so I so I had that base. But what what Lalu did, you know, was two things. One was make it specific to organizations and say how it showed up, you know, at mm -hmm. um, amber, you know, uh, uh, orange, green, and teal, and obviously specifically doing the, the big case studies on, you know, the twelve, whatever it is, dozen mm -hmm. uh, clients or organizations that are using teal practices. And 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 his careful documentation of and in the commonality between them um, yeah. was really. Uh, um, Did you know the correlation between the consciousness of a leader and how you know organization that connection that Lalu made in the sense of um, uh, right, yeah, not yeah that the, that the, the consciousness of the of the chief executive and the board, for instance, exactly. is the, the constraint on. Yeah, um, no, uh, I think I, I don't remember honestly specifically. Um, I, I think that that probably made some sense to me, but not not as crisply as as Lalu, you know, stated it. Uh, and, yeah. and 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 I so I I quote that a lot. Um, yeah. And and, it's, and also it, it it that that so dovetails beautifully with the leadership circle because it's you know I call it um, I don't even know what they call it anymore. Versailles that wants to change you're the first problem to solve. You're the first mind to expand because you, you have the constraint. 
right? So it's, mm-hmm. it's always going to be bottlenecked by you. So you've got to, you've got to raise yourself in order to raise the organization around you. <clears throat> and that's, that's so embedded in the leadership circles, philosophy and approach. And it, and it totally dovetails with, with what Lalu said. So that was like, a yeah. <laughs> uh, so maybe before we dive into the context, uh, contents of the book, um, Michelle, and how did you meet her and how did that collaboration and co-creation emerge uh, for the book? Um, uh, I, I met Michelle actually in about 2005 or six um, at a client. Um, she wasn't a coach at the time. Um, uh, and uh, at, at the, you know, when, when I knew her back then uh, in, mm-hmm. in Richmond, and then um, I, I lost track of her for you know many years, and and then re met her at uh, Agile 2015 um, in uh, Washington D.C. at the at the uh, whatever it's called the aquarium or whatever it is, mm. and um, you know and caught up with her about how much she um, you know because she had she had subsequently become a, a, an Agile coach and you know was was essentially leading a consulting practice um uh in it at, a, at the company she was working for and um i was like hmm, she would be a good person to leave you know because i was i already had the vision at of, of what, what i'm doing now uh mm-hmm. and back at aci you know uh to have a training side and then to have a coaching consulting side that did the kinds of things that we talked about in the training mm-hmm. <clears throat> that was the vision and i uh started out um being the CEO of both organizations. And, you know, Lisa was the president of ACI and, and Michelle was the president of uh, Transformation. Mm-hmm. So it was, so that's how we um, came together. And then sometime later uh, from that, you know, cause I was having trouble finishing uh, the book. I, you know, I, I dropped mm-hmm. it for, you know, more than a year, a couple of times, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I had released a, a draft of the first hundred pages of it in 2014, um, before all of this. <clears throat> and uh, I can relate to that because I've been doing the same thing. Uh-huh. And it's like uh-huh. it's uh, it's so tough, and it's been now like especially I keep making excuses. Even the reason that I started the podcast, I tell people is is not to write <laughs> um, <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a way of procrastinating from writing. <laughs> it's uh, so I can definitely relate. Uh, <laughs> So, so yeah, uh, how, so how Michelle did, helped me help me get it. Yeah, get it done. Michelle right? helped me get it done. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, just having another person there is really uh, obviously useful. And you know, Michelle had a lot of experience with uh, you know enterprise coaching work, and you know, a different take uh, than I. We were teaching together um, mm-hmm. Agile Transformational Leader class at the time, <clears throat> so we were we were teaching uh, people integral um, uh, a, a lot, and. Uh, you know, it, it was, it was, you know, it was, it's always a different voice when you have a collaborator. Um, there's, um, there's challenges and there's uh, benefits to having mm-hmm. a collaborator. Um, <clears throat> and thank goodness uh, she helped me get it done. <laughs> That's awesome. It, uh, it, it, it was such a relief to, to actually get it uh, out. Um, it, it was, it was a, it was hair raising at the end. It's I, I can only imagine because I know at difficult. least I was one of the people at least waiting and probably emailing saying, when, <laughs> when is it going to be? I, I've sent alerts on uh, Amazon to <laughs> let me know. <laughs> uh, so let's dive into the book. So uh, Agile Transformation using the Integral Agile Transformation Framework. Um, to think and lead differently. To think and lead differently, correct. (laughs) So uh, Integral Agile Transformation Framework, or IATF, um, uh, uh, how did you come up with that name? And um, I mean, I know how it it makes sense related to Integral and Agile, but did you think about any other different names or did that naturally make sense? Yeah, no, I I had, uh, yeah, that that came fairly early, if I recall. Mm-hmm. It wasn't. It wasn't any time recently. Um, it, I, I played with different names. Actually, one of the most interesting things that happened is um, uh, at the time that we, well, that that I released the um, uh, uh, first part of the book, the first hundred pages, the found, the integral foundation of it, and yeah. um, you know, we even had some book clubs on it 
um, for people. A couple of them um, back in 2014. Come to find out, I think when we did our uh, we, we did this program for enterprise coaches way back. Uh, we, we were the first people out of the gate doing enterprise coach training back in 2014. And mm -hmm. um, we, we did a thing called Integral Agile Wizardry, uh, a, a five-day boot camp. And we, we had people do the leadership circle, full pro, the full 360 profile. And we taught them a lot of integral stuff at an at a organizational level. And we taught them the Integral Agile Transformation Framework at the, as, such as it was at the time. Um, and, uh, come to find out that, that somebody else, cause he wrote me, uh, Johannes Shartu, I think that's how you say his last name, yeah. um, had, had just, uh, uh, coined the term integral agile as, yeah. as had I in parallel without knowing about each other. And, <laughs> and he, I don't, I don't know what he saw. He saw some kind of post or something. I don't, I don't, don't remember what it was now. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, he, he wrote us and, you know, uh, was like, holy shit. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, we invited him to be an assistant at this, uh, at the, our first boot camp actually, um, which was, which was cool to meet him. So, so I, I couldn't use integral agile, um, just by itself and, Self, uh, yeah. you know, transformation framework made sense. I mm -hmm. I'm actually in the middle of, of, in, in, with Michael Hammond of, of redoing that into a new version, into a sort of a, an emerging version from our integral sense making in action, um, mm -hmm. uh, work that we do and, and, uh, the, co the training, the, the coach training we do now. Yeah. So, so it's, uh, for me, it's, it's still emerging. It's still, you know, there's still other components like putting the sense making component in really specifically mm -hmm. into the framework um uh is for me that yeah because it, it's it, it is a sense making kind of yes. framework right exactly. um totally. and totally. I, I a lot of times i tell people you know the way that we use canavan to understand you know mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. context of system maybe this is like mm -hmm. a much bigger uh, mm -hmm. so let's dive into it so i don't know if you noticed but behind me here uh mm -hmm. four mm -hmm. quadrants um mm -hmm. agile to agility oh. maybe we can start <laughs> i've seen uh, that thing a hundred times i didn't and it's got a microphone <laughs> in the middle of it. i didn't i didn't realize it was quadrants yeah and see what it says green behind, green uh, black and teal are the three levels yeah it's green well it's it's teal and or, or mindset state. systems actions culture uh -huh. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. I thought when I was like, yeah. I don't want to bring up anything in the sense because I don't really like share <laughs> a screen, but like we can use uh, what's behind me to kind of have a context uh, and discussion. Uh, uh huh. Okay. Cool. Uh, so idea. maybe do you want to walk us through the uh, framework and just uh, you know from mm -hmm. a uh, 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 integral maybe the uh, yeah. the, the quadrants sure. and then maybe sure. you can allude sure. to the uh, uh, with green and. Uh, to the, the altitudes. Uh, yeah. altitudes yeah. yeah so so um the uh the full uh it, it's the the other name for integral is aqua all quadrants all levels a q a l and it really means all quadrants all levels all lines all states all types so it's the it's like a classification system of um Pretty much anything in the universe, and and where the, the perspective that that it, that it makes sense in, or that or that people, is a mapping system, right, to say how people are viewing something. Mm -hmm. So for me, the most important line is is the vertical line, in mm -hmm. in the diagram behind you uh, and uh, the logo behind you, and uh, in the integral quadrants, between the right side. I'm not sure this is coming out right, and the left. It is, yeah. I mean, people will be seeing, so like, and this goes back to like doing agile versus being agile in a sense, the right side. Yeah. That's yeah. Kind of visible. Um, I don't, I don't like to reduce it to that. I don't, I wouldn't yeah. argue with doing versus being, there's some truth in that for sure, but it's a little too, too narrow reduced, for me. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, I mean, so, so yes, more or less, but it's, 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 um, it's also the, the tangible, things that people can see and verify mm -hmm. like like behaviors like structures things that you know the org chart like um uh uh policy a, a, a practice like a policy yeah. Yeah. yeah so so there are things that people can print or or somehow touch uh mm -hmm. in some way or, or view you know it's it's, it's subject to the, the senses whereas the left hand is intangible and um 
and has to do with, you know, how we think, what we think, how we feel, uh, the way that we feel, um, uh, and the way that we make sense together uh, collectively. So um, the, the right side has, um, excuse me, uh, complexity, and the left side has depth. Mm-hmm. So we talk about, um, you, you could talk about consciousness becomes more complex, but it's probably more accurate to say consciousness becomes deeper. Deeper, yeah. So culture it, it and consciousness in, or mindset and, and culture become deeper, but behaviors and systems become more complex. Yes. Yes. Uh, driven by com- uh, uh, deeper consciousness um, or constrained by um, you know, you, you know, because so so people can do a stand up practice, right? And they can mm-hmm. they can sort of follow the rules, quote unquote. But if they don't have the consciousness to support it, they're not going to do it p- properly, particularly, right? That's mm-hmm. why it turns into a status meeting to the to the scrum master or or you know where they check out and they don't listen to each other. That's mm-hmm. not <laughs> that's not doing a stand up. <laughs> I mean, that's going through the motions of it. Exactly. It's, it's it's enacting the behaviors on the right hand side. But it's not having the consciousness or the the attitude or the intention on the left hand side. Mm-hmm. So, because especially because um, different kinds of cultural uh, codes at different levels prioritize or marginalize right hand versus left hand. Um, you know, the integral, uh, the the thing that's useful about integral is it brings that back to us that that you know that. You know, structures sure as hell are important. You know, the org mm-hmm. structure is definitely important. The policies for performance management review and stuff are really important. And and the practices that people do are really important in coding standards and whatever. But also so are people's attitude toward it. So are people's, uh, you know, emotional intelligence, um, people's th- thinking patterns and whether they can mm-hmm. see through their thinking patterns, whether they can uh, intentionally make sense together do sense making together or whether they you know like group mind is um uh we're we're sense making in a in a sort of illegitimate way we all we always come to the same conclusion you know rather Mm -hmm. than actually look at the data for instance that's that's a left hand side thing in large part so uh upper upper left is uh the i quadrant the internal of of an individual you everybody and uh the lower left, the we quadrant, is um, you know uh, in the in the book we call it uh, culture and relation, culture and relationship, mm-hmm. organizational culture and relationship. Um, it, it is about how we share. You know, we have uh, um, we have a shared experience. The, the, you know, the, how you uh, you go into a team room back in pre-COVID days. You probably you remember, you know, actually working with teams in person, um, perhaps. Maybe you're not that old, um, and and uh, uh, you feel a different thing when you go into a given team room. It, it doesn't feel the same as going into a different team's room, does it? Different, and that's the we space. That's the we um, perspective. Is is where we we sense we you know we've evolved to sense other people's feelings and intentions and whatever. And on the right hand, um, we have practices and behavior. Upper right, it third person singular and um uh in the bottom right we have uh it's third person plural which there's technically there's not a such a thing you know kim kind of made it up uh, but it, it makes sense i mean i mean yeah. it's a, you know it's a collective it's versus an individual thing yeah. you know and we called it organizational architecture which includes structure and um policies and governance and all those kind of things yeah, so let's explore these. I thought like we start with the I or the mindset, the top left, uh-huh. because uh, you have three sections in the book and one section, the section two, is pretty much all about the I and development. And uh, well, one of the things uh, that you that, that I've heard actually before, but and I actually like it and I've used it in, in some of the writing that I'm doing uh, the, the referring to the mindset as an operating system and then also as right. a culture and operating. So maybe we could start with yeah. that in a sense yeah. like that first acknowledging that we've run different operating systems as yes. individuals, 
and as leaders yes. and uh, yes. Um, yes could you maybe just uh, touch upon that yeah sure yeah great thanks um good question uh uh useful question to me as a <laughs> the interviewee um so uh, so that you you asked about altitude so that's where we get into altitude so the quadrants are different perspectives that are all sort of at the same level they're not they're not more or less complex so just for other. listeners now we're talking green versus steel here so yes uh yeah. in the amber, quadrants amber or if you amber see two orange, boxes up steel. here yeah <laughs> yes uh, yes yes um so uh so consciousness any any given thing from any quadrant's perspective increases its complexity or its depth over time often or there's a natural evolutionary impulse in the universe to evolve and um so consciousness individual consciousness progresses uh the, the way we mapped it in the book there's 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 not hundreds but there's scores of ways that you could denote the progression from amber to orange to green to teal in consciousness itself in i mm -hmm. um we we uh use the leadership circle um reactive creative integral which is i i, I prefer in some context to, to talk about uh, bob keegan's work and socialized mind to self-authoring mind to mm -hmm. self-transforming mind so a leader who's that socialized mind is going to or, or anybody not, not just a leader but um is going to make decisions uh, and and take action based on what they think other people will think mm -hmm. based on an internalized um kind of cultural constraint or milieu that they're in they internalize basically so mm -hmm. it, it's a stage of development that that um children go through mm, maybe uh sometime in, in teenagerhood uh, early or late maybe depending on on the person and the culture they're in but this is the um, shift from subject to object right so uh, yeah. this uh we're talking about like uh, uh you know you talk about you know telling stories and in, in in this context of evolving from that socialized mind is like where everything's uh what others say you only see things from one perspective you're not kind of transcending yes. that yes like yes. you know what's the bigger picture here yes y yeah um, and I would say it specifically, technically, mm, you internalize the the views and beliefs and opinions of your milieu that you're in. Could be a religious milieu, could be a work milieu, could be your family. And obviously, it changes at different points in your life. It does. What, what yeah. the surround is, and 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 so you internalize that. And so if if somebody else uh, criticizes you you feel uh, criticized. If somebody else praises you, you feel praised and you, and you sort of buy so I'll give you. I'll give you a perfect it. example. And this is kind of like yeah. what uh, I had a lot of aha moment. So growing up in Sarajevo, yeah. right? You have Muslims yeah. and Christians fighting. Yeah. So if, yeah. You're, uh, if you're Christian, um, uh, uh, your perspective and if, uh, you know, Russians or somebody support you, you're like, yeah, you know, uh, anything yes, that has yes. to do with the right. Muslims, you're like, doesn't matter because right. you're part of that culture. Yeah. And I think you talked about how our culture shapes. Um, yeah. So you are brought up as it doesn't matter. It goes both ways. But once I started taking myself outside that situation and not looking at myself as one, but like just stepping out and saying like, look, <laughs> there are two, these group over three groups of people that are pointing fingers at each other and looking uh -huh. from a uh -huh. same, from a different perspective, but they really, uh, uh, you know, when you look at it, it, it you know, they, they, they're saying, uh, you, you know, you suck, you suck, but right. it's really right. with the bigger picture is like, we're more alike. <laughs> yes, then, then and, and in socialized, are. yes, and in socialized mind, you can only take the Christian perspective or the Muslim perspective, exactly. and and you and you vilify the the uh, that's that's basically an amber kind of thing to do, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's a uh, you know amber Claire, Gra Claire Graves found that amber was the most um, vicious in attacking mm -hmm. another system than any of the other levels. It's why you had the. It's why you had the uh, the holy wars, uh, the crusades and yeah. stuff. Most, you know, most genocide has been done in the name of the church of whatever church or, or name of religion. 
um, you know, more than anything besides. So we still see that type of stuff, like just to relate it back to organizations, those type of uh, operating systems, you know, even people like in government and some of the, uh, so some of the organizations. And then, um, you know, how do we transcend that into the orange? So, or... so that's where the subject object thing that you mentioned comes in yeah. is development altogether is moving from what I'm subject to, the, what I look through, my, the eyes that I, the, the lens that I look through mm -hmm. and what I look at, right? And, and at different stages of development, there's a different subject and a different object. So when those change, when the, when the former subject becomes the new object, then I develop, I, I grow significantly. So for instance, I, it, when I move to self-authoring mind, mm -hmm. self-authoring mind is like the sense of, um, I, 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 I'm my own person. Mm -hmm. you know i'm my own man i'm my own woman i don't i don't i don't depend on other people to tell me what's okay i listen to what other people say but i make mm -hmm. my own judgment mm -hmm. and that's so i have i have seen what i used to look through i've seen the social milieu that i'm in and its values and stuff and i start critiquing it i say mm -hmm. i agree with this thing and I don't agree with this thing. So I'm so that that's going, I'm I'm not I'm rejecting that and I'm importing this for myself. And I develop my own philosophy. And and I, I you know in, in leadership circle terms, I come become outcome creating. I focus on creating a vision of something, not not artistic creativity, but you know, I I focus on doing something, making making the world different in some way. Mm -hmm. And and most people are in the transition between those two operating systems. They're between socialized mind and self-authoring mind. Now, plenty of people, especially people that succeed in business, have moved to self-authoring. That's not really uncommon, but it's not. It's also not highly common. Mm -hmm. And then the next transition to self-transforming is is quite uncommon. Mm -hmm. Self-transforming then goes further than self-authoring, and now I critique my own uh, philosophy of life, and mm -hmm. I and I question my own assumptions, and I and I I, I open up to things that I used to reject in myself, you know, that sh sh like shadow work is bringing in mm -hmm. things that I don't like about myself that I project onto others, or I just repress or whatever. And there's all kinds of energy tied up in that. And I is self-transforming is, is, is about opening those floodgates mm -hmm. and, and letting in all of who I am and, and sort of being okay with that. And, and that's that a huge thing, everything. like it is our complexity. So it's almost like, you know, uh, I was trying to think about how to use an analogy, but it's like I was joking around with somebody that was talking. It's like running Windows ME in 2021, uh, uh, uh -huh. like a lot of times yes. uh, Windows ME yes. was good at certain point in certain contexts, yes. but trying right. to right. run it today, right. uh, things right. have evolved, the complexity. Yeah, yeah. So right. when it comes to leadership, right. uh, uh you talked about, you know, uh, the the, uh, uh, the cap, or we talked, maybe we, I didn't start recording, but like uh, the organization, depending, so like which operating system your leader is running, yeah, like how much right. essentially ego yeah. shows up and there's a lot right. more that go, right. like that kind right. of goes into this. How's that right. related to the effectiveness of organization and agility, uh, business <laughs> agility? Yeah, 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 good question. Um, so you can't, um, in, in, in the reactive, in the problem reacting mode, it's a socialized mind mode, mm -hmm. Keegan's socialized mind uh, leadership circles uh, outcome, or problem reacting, you can't create change. It's a, it's, a, it's a negative feedback loop that's status quo enforcing. It shifts you back to the status quo. I mean, that's what it's, that's the, you know, it's, it's the very design of the systemic structure um, is a, a negative feedback loop. Outcome creating is a positive feedback loop, so it, so it, it allows the creation of change to, in the direction of your vision. Mm -hmm. It's just the way you know people work. So um, if you're if you're trying to have business agility, you can't do that. It's actually impossible to run that on a, a reactive or socialized mind operating system. It just that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So, so to get to get into the game, essentially of agile leadership, you have to be at outcome creating because you just can't run the the apps on that on that operating system. Exactly. And to and to really get to servant leader, 
and transformational leader, you really pretty much need to be, you know, in the range of self-transforming mind. And the that's, way that you transform, where... like I think what you said, and maybe just to, uh, you know, come back to this kind of how do you upgrade between operating systems? Um, uh -huh. So uh, something that you wrote in your book uh, went along the lines of awareness is the beginning of the pathway to inner development or this upgrade, yeah. right? Yeah, right. So how, uh, you know, uh, can you maybe talk about the awareness? Because I think uh, that's mm -hmm. something that's mm -hmm. a lot of times we talk about awareness, but we don't really know what we're talking about <laughs> when mm -hmm. it comes to awareness. It's a way of becoming first mindful. So first one becomes mindful. Like in, in, in uh, Buddhist tradition I was trained in, um, like meditation practice creates mindfulness or, or mm -hmm. is a practice of mindfulness. And when we start paying attention to our thought stream and how it actually works and shows up, we start to become aware in a bigger sense. So mindfulness leads to awareness. Mm -hmm. And, and when, we, when we keep doing that, especially if we have an intention to grow or to shift or something, um, you know, we, we do. I mean, we, it, it, it might, might take working with a coach or with some meditation practices or some other kind of practices. Um, uh, it, 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 it's, it's helpful to interact with somebody who's, who's functioning from a higher level because they can ask you the questions from that mindset, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, but that awareness is also about uh, uh, also shifting your beliefs and assumptions. You're also right about yeah. that. And I yeah. think uh, uh, that's a really important um, uh, or key part of that upgrade is that uh, you, you you transcend the the old beliefs and the yes. old assumptions, right? Yeah, yeah. For, for instance, you, like for instance, just to maybe give people an example, of what we're talking about, because uh, 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 it, it's like you trans. If you believe that world is predictable and that right. it runs yeah. like a you know a yeah. machine, you transcend right. that. You start believing that the world is more like. I think you also reference this in your book. Write about this in your book. It's more like a you know complex adaptive system, and that it's more mm -hmm. unpredictable mm -hmm. than predictable. So those are the type of beliefs and assumptions mm -hmm. that you make, right? Yes, that you that you start to. You, you, so the first step is starting to see that you do that. Mm -hmm. And and the second step, so to speak, is to see what it costs you to do that. Mm -hmm. That's a deeper part of the mindfulness awareness is, is first seeing that it happens. And then second, seeing what the deficit of it is, yeah. because there is, there's, there's almost, there's always a limitation and a cost both to you mm -hmm. personally and to the people around you and to the work. I mean, the, the, you know, mm -hmm. at a lower level, our, our leadership effectiveness, for instance, you know, is not as great if we're reactive. It's just not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, like what you just made me think about is another thing that, and maybe sticking to the left side here and moving down to the culture, because I, I agree, like another thing that resonated with me in the book is that you said, you know, there's too much focus over the years on the right side on behaviors, actions, and down um, systems, but not as much, especially in the West on the uh, left side, culture and mindset. So one of the yeah. things that, uh, you know, you mentioned it earlier, collective leadership development, but you said collective consciousness of most senior leadership teams is not complex enough to lead in the world we right. find ourselves in. Uh, could right. you elaborate on that and talk about what you meant by that? Well, I mean, I, I've, I've worked with a, uh, quite a few leadership teams and they um if if you measure their collective effectiveness like with the leadership circle which has a scientific you know uh, measurement to it basically um mm -hmm. you know they're not they're not very effective and and that's because of some you know some of their um socialized mind patterns with each other their reactivity to each other they're being triggered mm -hmm. um by each other blaming each other um and they're they're deep there are deep conversations to uncover that people don't go to normally. I mean, business teams don't, you know, talk about collective sense making very much or my projections or whatever, mm -hmm. but, but they need to because <laughs> because it, it, it traps them into a certain way of being with each other in a certain set of it's, it's where, you know, it's, it's related to the idea of group think, right. Yeah. Is that we all believe certain things uh, together or, or pluralistic ignorance. 
mm -hmm. uh, which is is it also we, I mean, we talked about you talked about you know sense making but it's it's really about collective sense sense making down the culture and we right and being able to make sense as a leadership team and then also being able to yeah. align our um, values and beliefs um uh you know because we could still have um you know leadership team that's made up of just in terms of um you know somebody thinking from that you know amber um or orange and have a couple of people <laughs> maybe that are thinking or operating from another operating system that's green or teal and we how do you deal in that situation where you know probably people with those newer <laughs> or higher up or not uh, higher is not the term uh, right uh, term but like how do you get group of people that are running different operating systems to make sense of yes. things um, yes that's a that's a real challenge <laughs> so i i don't know i i, I last time we spoke and i think it, it, you said or somebody said like we're screwed in a sense because it goes <laughs> right. back to uh you know what uh robert keegan wrote about like, in over our heads uh meaning uh -huh. like our uh our our environment is more complex than our that we can comprehend or most people can comprehend yes, yes. Y yes it's probably more complex than any of us can comprehend, but some some of us are. I mean, if if you if you if you if you shift it to a center of gravity that's higher on the developmental scale, you're probably going to be more effective. You're you're almost certainly going to be more effective than you than you were. Maybe not than somebody else per se, but you're going to be more effective than you were before. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to increase my own uh, leadership effectiveness if I if I move up from reactive to creative. There's no question, really. So, so you know, what's interesting to me is you also call uh, the operating system that's running at the we or culture, so bottom left. So now yeah. we have operating system, um, yeah. leadership operating yeah. system that's yeah. running uh, in I yeah. or right. uh, the top right. left. So how, uh, you know, th that, that that is really like that depth that you talked about. Um, now we're talking about, you know, culture is, you know, made up of this uh, uh, collective operating systems, which is really yes. collective beliefs yes. and assumptions. Yes. Uh, yes. And it's, and it's, um, um, so, so, but, but uh, the, the trick is that it's not, it's not per se your individual results and my individual results and her individual results and, and somebody else's individual results all added together. It's more, mm -hmm. It's, it's more mysterious than that. You know, it comes out of like for, in an organization, it comes out of the founding, out of the founder or mm -hmm. founders, um, out, of, out of the culture that was developed, you know, uh, way back, which might not at all fit who is leading now, right? Mm -hmm. it, but but, it, but it state, there's a persistence to it because systems have their own living quality. They're, mm -hmm. they're not, it's it's not one plus one is is two right it's it's so um, it's that i mean like the, the, another thing that reminds me at least of back home it's like you know the culture like for instance for people that you grow up anywhere but in the balkans like you know it's the vision of the people that you know started the country or the, the experiences so when you're born into it uh, you're kind of affected by the history. So in that bottom yes. right, yes. it's the right. history and all the rituals and everything that's yes. impacting that operating yes. system. Yes, yes. Well, yeah, in, in both the right and left, I mean, it's the, it's the cultural feeling about the things and it's the specific structures like, you know, we have certain holidays, um, you know, for, to celebrate certain religious things or, or cultural things that are important. Um, the, the ceremony of that, uh, you know the structure of it the, the actual enactment of it yeah so uh so these are like in the book you also talk about five integral disciplines um mm -hmm. part, uh, consciousness change evolving consciousness conscious change sorry which is different than evolving consciousness we talked about evolving consciousness or i that would be the top left uh, evolving um, systemic complexity, which is actually the we, which we just talked about. Yes. Um, yes. Then we have evolving adaptive architecture, which is the bottom right, the systems, right? Yes. And then we have evolving product innovation, which is the I top right. So let's maybe right. spend a little bit of time here just on it and it's so or evolving adaptive architecture 
and product innovation. And then I would like to finish maybe with the conscious change and leading change uh, uh -huh. as you kind of finish uh -huh. with that in the book. So what, based on what we just discussed on evolving the mindset and culture, um, how does that relate to the right side of the quadrants of practices and structures? Oh, how does evolving consciousness uh, uh, relate to that? Yeah. So, for instance, if I'm a leader, or how do yeah. like what right. I, uh, right. what I'm getting at is if I'm somebody that believes in a stable environment, uh, and uh, right. how does that going to impact the right side? What type of policies yeah. do I define? Well, yeah, sure, sure. So, so two two kind of uh, basic issues there. One is obviously the consciousness of the person or persons team mm -hmm. or something that define those adaptive structure or those non-adaptive structures, those organizational architecture structures. Um, well, obviously, you know, a, a, a reactive mind is going to design a reactive structure. I mean, that's just you know, pretty obvious. Um, mm -hmm. But so that's one issue is, is the level of evolution leader. But the other one is the culture itself, right? It doesn't matter, you know, like you see it in government a lot. Um, government is is uh especially in it i think has has drafted a lot of really visionary cios and cto kind of <clears throat> people that have you know um uh really really progressive visions for what to do but they're unable to do that because they're working in yeah. government i mean i mean in, in in a culture that's much more powerful than they are as mm -hmm. even if they're the top leader i mean you can't you know i mean if you have if you have thousands and thousands of employees that every day recreate the culture you, it's hard to make a dent in that right? I, I agree yeah. i was working one of the biggest uh, public agencies in california and that's exactly it mm -hmm. like doesn't mm -hmm. matter they mm -hmm. brought somebody mm -hmm. like that that really uh um and that reflects in practices i mean what else i mean like how does uh the the left side impact the right side and what have you seen what other examples can you give us well, actually, can we go the opposite way? So how does sure. the right side yeah. impact the left yeah. side? Um, so, because we haven't talked too much about the right side. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, like there's, a, there's an old saying um, in, uh, in business that where you stand on an issue depends on where you sit, like what department you're in. Uh -huh. So, so what, you, what you stand for is dependent on what department you're in or what, what organizational perspective you're, you know, are you in marketing? That's a different perspective than customer support, very different, or than engineering. I mean, and they, they, they have, there's conflict, there's tension often in systems at those boundaries because they don't see the world in the same way, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you are, you know, the, the structure that you're in, who you report to, makes a difference in your consciousness. I mean, you, you don't, you know, with some people you'll develop, but some people you'll have to shut yourself down, right? Mm -hmm. So the structure um, uh, molds our consciousness as well as, you know, consciousness designs, molds. <laughs> you know, systems. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, but is, uh, you know, the, the, the quadrants, there's never a, there's never a sense of, of there's one quadrant that's the best. They, mm -hmm. they all have power and they all influence each other. Each other, yeah. Um, I mean, that comes like, you know, in the sense of like, if we go to the top, uh right like imposing change versus co-creating right yeah right right um uh, we a lot of times see how like sometimes if we're imposing change it's going to impact the mindset of people and if we co-create it's gonna uh, yeah. uh impact it um yeah what else i mean uh from, from a perspective what, what else would you like to share uh from the interplay between the four quadrants or four um areas? Well, um, uh, like we're, we're uh, we do a um, uh, a cohort for uh, people to to become uh, masterful in enterprise coaching, uh, an IC Agile, uh, IC EC program, and um, uh, just had a, a, a one of the people in that um, report uh, in the most glowing kind of effusive terms his conversation with a with a, I can't remember if it was a CIO or a SVP but you know somebody in the leadership position and and walked him through both holons 
you know, the level of, uh, uh, you know, individual uh, uh, team department um, uh, organization. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so he walked them through whole lines and the quadrants and they found all kinds of, this, this person was responsible for the transformation. And they found all kinds of insights from that. I mean, they just, it, it was just like, it blew up in a, in a good yeah. way. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just, it was just another reminder about, we, we, we tend to have a, you know, we have a group think bias about, you know, um, you know, we're probably, uh, uh, biased toward the left-hand quadrants. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, m most people are biased toward the right-hand quadrants, but who, uh, or organizations are at least, um, people in the agile community actually are, are much more left-hand quadrant or oriented I've, I've found. Um, but when we, uh, we, we always miss, you know, looking from a different quadrant perspective. And there's always interesting stuff, useful stuff to uncover if we shift perspectives from our natural one. For me, mine, mine is we. When I, yeah. when I shift to looking from an it's point of view or from an it point of view, I see new stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and so, the, you know, the, the, the quadrants are all about the... Um, Holistic uh, view, maybe? Yes, yes, uh, and 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 holistic and comprehensive. Like it, mm -hmm. it takes the the fundamental things that are in you know Ken Ken came up with or, or realized really um, uh. the four quadrants by looking at you know hundreds of different systems of thought throughout mankind's history, and going uh. oh there's a commonality. They're either okay. a first person perspective or a second person or a third person, and that's part of why they argue with each other so much. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so the, 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 the advice that we take from that is, you know, have a, have a multi-quadrant change team so that, so that you have people with different expertise. Some people are really good at it. Some people are really good at we. Some people are good at I. Some people are good at it. Yeah. All those perspectives are valid and useful. And so how can you, that's, that's part of uh, how you do conscious change is, is you have a change team or, or whatever, uh, steering committee or, or uh, what have you um, that has an orientation toward all the quadrants because they, because they were, and, and all the altitudes because it reveals exactly. different things that are going on. And we don't see that. So maybe as a, as a last thing here, like let's talk about this conscious change uh, training and coaching using the, um, the framework. So um, what are some of the things, I mean, like when it comes to teaching, when it comes to coaching, when it comes to conscious change, using the, using the framework as a sense-making framework um, mm -hmm. to, to drive that change, to teach people about, you know, uh, uh, how they can make better sense of things that are going on. So, well, so how do you, yeah. maybe let's start with teaching. What are, you know, what are some of the things that you see people uh, go like is the one that you alluded earlier, but what else? Yeah. Uh, so, so, so we, we, uh, Michael Hammond and I um, uh, teach a workshop uh, called Master Camp, which is for people that are transitioning from being uh, team coaches to being enterprise coaches or who are already doing enterprise organizational level work and want to up their game that way. And we use the integral framework and his uh, evolve agility sense-making framework because they both, they dovetail really, really nicely together. You know, we, we take people through, you know, exercises and, and whatnot with that and a, and a case study, a, very, a really serious case study um, uh, project that they have to do. And we use the integral, you know, the, the basically the, the framework from the book uh, with, like I say, added stuff with uh, uh, sense making and also actually with human system dynamics um, work with uh, adaptive action, Glenda O. Young. Um, and, uh, we, you know, we, so we, we have them do exercises like design an integral assessment of, of your organization. Um, mm -hmm. you know, look from, ha have things that address all four quadrants, not just your favorite. Right. Um, so that, I mean, you know, which creates a stretch for people. I mean, whatever quadrant or two it is that, you know, some quadrant is going to be a stretch for every, mm -hmm. for anybody. Um, you know, uh, uh, we, we do uh, sense-making conversations. Um, we teach them a practice to do deliberate sense-making, a very mm -hmm. simple practice, but, but one that highlights how I make sense for me to see how I make sense of things, what I make up, mm -hmm. what, the, what the story is behind it. Um, you know, uh, and then uh, adaptive action, something uh, we didn't cover in the book, um, 
that I've come across subsequently and really fallen in love with is uh, adaptive actions in you know the HSD framework is uh, containers, differences, and exchanges. You have to make a change in a self-organizing system in either its containers or its differences or its exchanges. And you don't, you know, just you, you, one, you don't believe that you can plan change because you can't. Mm -hmm. um, you can adapt to change. You can dance with change. You can create an intention, right? And you can do experiments. You can change a container, like you know, Agile is all about. Uh, you know, like defining clear containers, like a team plus or minus seven people, right, is a container. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's uh, you know, you get Agile is about really good container differences and exchange practices in a lot of ways. That's part of a lot of why it works really well. And that's the, that's the currency you have to change stuff in an organization. Mm -hmm. You change how one of those parameters works and, and you see what happens. You don't, you mm -hmm. don't think that you're in control because you're not <laughs> yeah and that that makes me think about like just that now maybe sh to, just to bring in the coaching and consulting sense like uh, and making sense like you know a lot of times coaches um have like one size fits all or maybe they even just coaching yeah. on the framework yeah. and like right. when i go in right. like you know when you start talking to a team or organization you're making sense okay you know who are these people what is the yeah. organization is this yeah. orange type of organization is this leader right. or team made up yeah and you're constantly making sense yeah. of what's going on and your approaches are yeah. changing right based yeah. on yes absolutely yeah, and and a, a way that that can go right and a way that that can go wrong when I, you know, assess that an organization center of gravity is an achievement orange, for instance, is mm -hmm. the way I can go wrong is for me to pigeonhole them into that and limit what they can do and, and pre sort of have a prejudice against them, really. Mm -hmm. And and the way that that can be helpful, on the, on the other hand, is... Um, if, if they do have an achievement orange center of gravity, then I need to talk achievement orange language or I'm not going to reach exactly. that. If, if, I, if I don't, if I don't blend on some level with those values, I'm not, I'm not going to be effective. Right. Exactly. So, so knowing that is useful for, you know, just like you, you know, you know how to talk to people that are at a different age. I mean, you don't talk to uh, an adult the way you talk to a, a, a six-year-old mm. and, and you don't talk to, most adults, the way you might talk to a 95 year old person. So do you, you know, think you talked about safe? You talked about safe in the book. Do you think, uh, you know, Dean and safe is did a really good job of talking to people in their language and selling? Yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. That's, that's, I mean, and they aim the framework for in terms of the uh, uh, integral uh, okay. safe, particularly, but, but, uh, to some extent, all scaling frameworks, but especially safe. I'm, I'm most familiar with safe, probably. Yeah. Um, he, he, they aimed it at the its quadrant, at the organizational architecture quadrant in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. You know, the Scrum framework, you know, is is goes in the it quadrant and it doesn't yeah. need much. But but you know, it doesn't have funding in it, doesn't have governance in it, doesn't have you know all kinds of things in it that it that an organization needs. And safe handled those things, and so it took it, it took some of the role stuff. What, what what do you call the people you know that used to be directors of you know IT or whatever? Yeah. You know, what do you call them in a in an agile uh, framework? And you know Dean gave them names, and that that mm -hmm. created comfort for people. And it's a it's a very orange um, with a, with shades of green kind of framework. That that's the mm -hmm. altitude of it for, for, in my experience. And mm -hmm. I and I think I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to say that that's inherently true per se. It's the way it's practiced, though. The way it's practiced right. is by achievement orange organizations that adopted in a way to, you know, uh, install the agile. Mm -hmm. And that's what I spoke with Dean a couple of uh, weeks ago now. And like, I, I think oh, yeah. he gets it. Uh, he uh, gets uh, it in uh. a sense. But I think it's also mm -hmm. the side that people are want this and like, hey, if you grab this and it's shiny object and you want to do that, you know, <laughs> you know, implement it from that orange perspective, then, you know, go ahead and do it. Um, but mm. maybe to, uh, one of the things that I believe, uh, the book that you, uh, you wrote here and, uh, uh, when I'm talking to people that I consider, um, uh, uh, are thought leaders in agile, um, we're moving towards, uh, what you're describing in this book. And I think the next 10 years and, and what you've been talking for the last 10 years is about to get more traction. 
Um, mm, yeah. I think we'll yeah. start seeing and slowly yeah. people are starting to see. And it's, uh, yeah. it's interesting that, uh, and maybe my question is around how do we, uh, in your ways, how do we amplify uh, the understanding or concepts from, from your book so they become more of a mainstream, so more people are aware of uh, uh, this framework and this, how yeah. similar to how people like, I remember like, you know, going through or when I teach about Canavan, people start making sense of, of the framework and yeah. how they can right. use it. Right. Uh, this right. is in a similar ways. Now we can have make a sense of a whole organization. And yeah. when I introduce people, they go, holy shit. Now I know why my organization is so messed up. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the experience I have, especially giving talks. Yeah. is that people go oh that's what's going on <laughs> i you know it's it's uh using the integral framework is so different than than implementing safe because it's not it's it's not something that you that you teach to everybody in the organization there's no need to do that you you mm -hmm. teach it to the coaches uh, or or the transformation leaders that are going to be using it in the background it's not something you foreground with the client particularly it's it's something that the coach knows how to do it's like a skill set of how to mm -hmm. assess what's going on in an organization what quadrant does it align with and what altitude you know uh, amber orange green teal does it align with because that tells you how to work with it it tells you you know if, if it's an it's thing it says hmm you might want to look for what are the we components that reinforce that it's thing or what are the it or i components that do and what altitude mm -hmm. it comes from tells you what's possible you know in, in, in an orange organization you're not going to adopt holacracy that's a horrible idea <laughs> it's a horrible okay. idea for agile coaches to suggest to their clients to to implement holacracy unless they're a pretty darn small organization or have a really really strong commitment and are already you know operating from pluralistic green it's mm -hmm. just not going to work it's not going to make sense to them it's it's like you know, it's like uh, uh, teaching a, a six-year-old integral calculus. No, that's a bad idea. <laughs> Don't ready, do yeah. that. Exactly. Yeah. Doesn't need it. Not going to, brain's not going to have the cognitive capacity for it right now. Another thing that we didn't talk about, and we don't necessarily, but I think just maybe to make a point and in Spiral Dynamics that you can't skip. So you can't skip the upgrades right. from operating systems. You have to gradually right. upgrade, uh, right. which is uh, uh, kind of tough. But maybe uh, uh, as we kind of wrap up here, what, what message, what would you like to inspiring coaches, change agent leaders, um, what would you maybe invite them to do or uh, um, recommend? Uh, uh, Get, get get exposure to the integral framework um, from my book, from my classes, from other places uh, around because it will change how you are able to see things and how effective you're able to be. And and the other thing that's sort of related to it um, or, or is, is the bigger subset of it is that the, the most impactful thing you can do, especially working at an organizational level, is to grow yourself because the coach is the, is the greatest instrument of transformation that they have more than any technique they know or anything else. So if, if I've developed myself, um, I'm going to be more effective. I'm going to be less constrained. I'm going to be less triggered by clients. Um, uh, you know, I'm just going to be, you know, and they can't go further than I can go.